Everyone receives a miracle, but not everyone ends up being significant. Your marriage will not succeed just because you love yourselves. Your marriage will succeed because both of you love God. If love can grow, love can die. So what it means is that you must be intentional. People of God, good to be with you again. And today, something my heart has been indicting on a very good matter. And the matter is a matter of gratitude and thanksgiving. Gratitude and thanksgiving. One of the signs of the last days is men will become extremely very unthankful. But then again, it beats me more when the unthankfulness extends to God. Little mercies, that's what we call it. Great deliverances, that's what it will seem to some people. But in the midst of all this, the desire of God concerning our lives is that we do not lose it in the place of thankfulness, in the place of gratitude. Interesting as it may seem, what comes to mind is the story of that one leper who returned back to give Jesus thanks. And I believe there are destiny lessons that we must take out from the life of this leper, especially as we read the book of um, Luke chapter 17. I'm, I'm not going to read that, but Luke 17 from verse 11 to 19. I am more interested in letting us know the destiny lessons that God wants us to learn from, from, from the life of this leper. Do remember that it was only this leper there were 10 of them that were healed and it was only this one leper that who was a Samaritan who came back to say, thank you, Lord. Only this leper who was a Samaritan that came back to say, thank you, Lord. Do you realize that one major lesson that we learned from this is all the others were from Jesus' place and so there was no need. Only this leper that was a Samaritan he was a stranger. He did not let familiarity, he did not allow familiarity rob him of his thanksgiving. Oh, how familiar we show up to be with the Lord. Oh, how familiar we claim to be with him. Oh, how familiar we are with the things he does for us. We sleep, we wake up, we run out not knowing that it's such a blessing. Things that don't happen for others happen for us. We are too familiar with the gift, with the blessings of God that we do not no longer take it like a huge miracle and like a blessing. Please, familiarity is a sure way to shut down access. Familiarity is your own way of trying to say to God, I am used to what you're doing. You might as well stop. And one powerful lesson that we learn from the life of the one leper that returned to give thanks among the 10 people of God. Everyone receives a miracle, but not everyone ends up being significant. Gratitude is the access. Gratitude is the password. Can I say it again? Everyone receives a miracle, but not everyone ends up being significant. Where are the nine? What did they come up to be? Who did they eventually turn out to? We do not know. They were not significant because there was no gratitude. Oh my God. So it's possible for God to do something in the life of someone, but yet it will not be significant in destiny. God forbid. That is the reason why you need to wear again your garment of gratitude. And it becomes very important again to look at the fact that gratitude, especially to God, is coming from the place where they were still on their way to meeting the priest when they, the, one of the lepers looked at himself and found out that he was clean from his leprosy. Ah, he wasn't going to wait anymore. He ran back to say thank you to Jesus. Don't wait for your process to be complete before you say thank you. Do not wait for your process to be complete before you say, oh, I want to thank that. No, don't wait. Don't wait. Again, I say don't wait. Thank the Lord while you're still in the hallway of your miracle. While you're still in the expectation, begin to bless the name of the Lord. While you're beginning to see the signs already, begin to bless the name of the Lord. Because you know what? Gratitude 
is the pathway to a major harvest. Gratitude is your way of trying to say, God, someone says that when you are thankful, that your tank will be full. And that's exactly what the spirit of gratitude does. I want you to understand that thanksgivers are not in the majority. One came back among 10. So please do not look at your neighbor to become the benchmark of how you thank God. Otherwise, you might think that maybe you are overdoing it because thanksgivers are not in the majority. So every, everybody wants to get from God, but only a few persons are willing to say, God, we remember who you are. We remember how good you've been. Thanksgivers are never in the majority. And ask yourself, am I part of the thanksgivers? Am I part of those who take the mercies of God for granted? And people of God, when the one leper returned back, he lifted up his voice and he cried out, thanking the Lord. Remember, it was actually the same way he came to beg. They lifted up their voices and here was the lepers trying to say, I know the way I asked you. I know the way I begged you. The same way I asked you is the same way I'm returning with my thanksgiving. The same way, people of God, it's amazing to know how intense our prayers are. But when it comes to thanksgiving, because that phase is over you, because that burden is now off, you casually say thank you. You knew how bothered you were while you were on that journey. But when you came back, you, you casually say thank you to the Lord. And I'm here to ask you yet another question. Are you truly grateful? The intensity of your request should also be the same intensity of your thanksgiving. And Jesus would ask a question. He said, where are the nine? Where are the nine? Where are the nine? So he was expecting them. Do you know the Lord is expecting your thanksgiving? Yes, he is expecting. He knows what he did. You knew what he also did for you. And he says, I'm still expecting you. Jesus had to ask, where are the nine? Where are the nine? He's expecting the promise you made. and say, Lord, if you will do this for me, this is what I'm going to do. Where are the nine? And he's calling you, where is John? Where is Jerry? Where is... Ronald, where, where are you? He's asking, where are the nine? And it's important for you to know that Thanksgiving is very expressive. You cannot say you are a Thanksgiver when you are not expressive with your thanks. Oh, when I see how calm people are, when I see how people just, and they say, oh no, I know what I feel in my heart. I know what I feel in my heart. No, sir. Remember the woman with the her alabaster box of oil. She came to Jesus. It was worth a one-year salary. And she broke everything at the feet of Jesus. And the songwriter said, though she spoke no words, everything she said was heard. As she poured her love to the master from the box of her alabaster. And the songwriter says, I've come to pour my praises on him from the alabaster. Don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and wipe them with my hair. That is a heart of gratitude. They don't know what Jesus did for you. And you cannot act all calm and calculated as if he did nothing for me. And people of God, I want to say it again, that Thanksgiving is an act of faith because Jesus was going to look at that person that came back and says, thy faith has made thee whole. Thanksgiving is your saying, Lord, as I'm returning this thanks to you, I still have faith in your capacity and in your ability to do more. And I want to say this to everyone again, that you do not have to wait for man's validation in order to give your thanks. Don't wait for man's validation because apparently the other nine were waiting for the priest. Ah, go and show yourself to the priest and say, ah, the priest has not yet confirmed us healed. But then again, this one was not going to wait for man's validation. He just wanted to give Jesus thanks. Sometimes you're waiting for man to tell you how to give him thanks. Sometimes you're waiting for man to direct you to what you should use to give him thanks. No, don't wait for man. Express your thanksgiving to him the way you feel on the inside. Remember, he asked, where are the nine? We have a master who is patiently waiting. Whether Jerry will come to his consciousness, 
that there's a need to give thanks for what he's done. The heart of a thanksgiver. The heart of a thanksgiver. Remember, if you want more, maybe you should be more mindful about giving thanks more. Our Father, we thank you. Jesus will give you all the glory for what you've done in our lives. And Father, we ask, oh God, that you cause us to be thanksgivers, ready to pour from our alabaster box of thanksgiving to you. Help us, oh God. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. This is Pastor Ezekiel Atan ministering to you all the way from Uyo, Akwaibom State, Nigeria. We've been talking about uh, understanding marital foundations. We read from the book of Psalm chapter 11, verse 3, and it says, If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And we are still looking for how to answer that question until now. But we found out that the best way to answer it is to bring down the house and start afresh. Because when you have a bad foundation, you put people inside of that house, you'll be risking the lives of people. So we said we were talking about types of foundation. Remember the topic is understanding marital foundations. Understanding marital foundations. Let's look at number one foundation, and that's the foundation of love. Foundation of love. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31, it says, but thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. And then you love your neighbor as yourself. That's the most powerful, and that's the, one of the biggest foundations for a successful marriage. Marriage is not sustained and can never be sustained by the chemistry law, the love of chemistry or chemistry law, the chemical reaction, all that hype, you know, butterfly in the stomach and... Um, loss of control and all that. Marriage is not sustained. That can become an attraction for marriage, but marriage can never be sustained by those things. Okay? So most times when people are talking about that kind of love, what's in their mind is sexual love and so on and so forth. But not, they've not struck deep to find out exactly what kind of love that they have. The real love we're talking about here, according to our text that we read in Mark chapter 12, is love for God. Love for God. Let me state as, as clearly as I can that your marriage will not succeed just because you love yourselves. Your marriage will succeed because both of you love God. He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, or your emotions, and with all your strength. Meaning that love has order. There is a natural progression of real love. Real love begins with God, then to yourself, and then to your neighbor, in this case, your partner. So where there is no love for God, there is no possibility of real love to end for anybody else. Do, do not marry a man or woman who does not evidently love God. There must be an evidential love for God. They must love God. And the Bible says, how do you love the Lord? If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. And so obedience to God, which is obedience to his word, obedience to his spirit, obedience to spiritual authorities, those are the three dimensions of obedience to God. If you love me, keep my commandment. Any man or woman who does not evidently love God is not capable of loving a neighbor. Is not capable of genuinely loving someone else. You must never, the Bible has never been wrong. And so you must... Hold on to the Bible as your ultimate reference. Any man or woman that does not evidently love God cannot love anyone else, especially at that level. It would take the love of God in the person's heart to enable the person uh, to love a neighbor very well. And in this case, we are talking about your spouse or would-be spouse. And so check it out very well. Make sure. They love God. If they love God, they will love themselves. And if they love themselves, they will, in the same measure they love themselves, they will love whoever is the closest person to them. Having said that, now let's come down to um, specifics. What are the various kinds of love? Because you cannot just go by uh, what you think love is and then you just run with it. There are at least three to four different kinds of love. The first kind of love is the agape love, the God kind of love. 
is the kind of love that is spoken about in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 when God said to the wife or to the husband, husbands love your wife as Christ loves the church. So it's a specific target kind of love. He didn't say you should just love your wife. No, he said love your wife. And this is the manner in which you love your wife as Christ loves the church. How did Christ love the church? He laid down his life for the church. What the kind of love he loved the church was sacrificial love. Unconditional and sacrificial. That's the kind of love. So what, how are you supposed to love your wife? You have to love your wife unconditionally. You don't love her because I know it's difficult, it's tough. That's why God said we should love our wives that way. Why? We are the bride of Christ and that's exactly how he loves us. He is the model husband. He is the pattern husband and he's teaching us how to be husbands. He said, love your wives as Christ loves the church. This is very, very critical. Any man or woman who does not have an effective relationship with God, that's strong love for God, will not be able uh, to love a spouse. It will be a very big challenge. All right? So Christ loved and still loves the church sacrificially. Sacrificially. He gave himself. The best thing you can do to your wife or do for your wife, husband, is to give yourself. You can equip the house, give, the wife, you give, give your wife all the gifts in the world. At the end of the day, what your wife wants from you is you. A woman's number one desire is affection or attention. Very important. Once that, that foundation of agape love is not there, uh, there's going to be a very big problem. So that's how you're supposed to love your wife. And he told the wife, he said, wife, submit unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So when he told the when he told the man to love his wife, he said, love your wife as Christ. You need to take note of the word as. is a simile as Christ loved the church, which means there's a relationship with God. And then when he told the wife to, to submit to the husband, he said, as unto the Lord, which means again that there is a relationship. So there must be agape love, love for God for us to achieve success in marriage. It's a very important foundation of marriage. And you want to know what agape love is? You know, the love of God or agape love cannot be defined. It can only be described. And it's effectively described in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 1, I think all the way down to 7. It's effectively described. Okay? So you will see God being described. Everything described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the description of God because God is love. Hallelujah. I hope you have been blessed today and I pray the love of God to be shed abroad in your heart as you go through this series with me. Uh, I'm sure you have learned a lot. You can take notes and hopefully uh, follow uh, Phronesis on Instagram and also follow me on Instagram and on Facebook. You will see the details on the screen and you will be most blessed. Till we come your way again, same station next week on Phronesis. God bless you. Have a great weekend. And a blessed coming week in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi there. So, season's greetings again, and today I'm speaking to the married folks. All right, we're looking at tips for married people in this festive season. Um, one of the things you need to do in this festive season is to take time off. Um, in my years as a counselor, I discovered that a lot of marriages go through um, different seasons. And one of the things that makes it difficult is when life begins to happen. So maybe when kids begin to come, maybe when uh, bills begin to pile, 
you find out that the love just begins to wane. So one of the things you need to do as a married couple is to maximize spending time together. So this festive season is a good time to take time off. So please plan your holidays, plan your break, um, whether it's short or long, but plan to take time off. Look, if love can grow, love can die. That's what you need to realize. Many people think that their love will just keep growing. They think their passion will just remain. We have a popular saying in our ministry, we say that you must move from emotional love to intentional love because that's what kills many marriages. They start from emotional love and they wonder why did they grow apart. They wonder why did they stop loving um, each other. They, they move from I can't live without you to I can't live with you. They move from I love you to death to I hate you to death. Um, <laughs> what happened is usually because they allowed the love to die. All right. And one of the things you can do, you know, to build that love is to take time off and create time to spend together. The festive season is a good time, you know, to do this. Take a time off. If possible, take a little vacation. It doesn't have to be an exotic trip. All right. Um, we've always had a culture in my family to take a break dur during the festive season. And we didn't start by traveling to any exotic place. Sometimes it's just a city next door. You know, sometimes it's just somewhere in the same city, but a different environment. You see, there is power in a different environment because it kind of, you know, spooks the routine. Um, one of the things that kills love is routine. So when you move to a different place, when you take a holiday, um, it has a way of rejuvenating your, your passion and your mind and everything. It's very helpful for a relationship. Okay, so um, take time off this festive season. It might be just go to the in-laws place or um, the next city or even just the same city but a different part of it. Just break that routine. Break that routine if you can, all right? But the important thing is to take time off to spend time with family, all right? Plan some family events. Plan some family events, all right? Do things together as a family. So if you have kids, then this is an important part. You need to, um, you know, uh, plan events with the kids. But there will also be times where you need to get help, you know, with the kids so that you, the husband and the wife, can spend time together, all right? Very important. Uh, so there are times you need to spend time with the kids. So do something the whole family can do together. If there are games, the whole family can play together. Play together. It's a good time for you to teach your kids how to cook because they're not going to school. So teach them how to cook, teach them um, how to clean. Do something together. That's the point, all right? Do something together um, so that they, they will learn. They will, they will, you'll build culture in them. you build value um, in them at this time. Then for the husband and the wife, the spouses, what you need to do, find something both of you enjoy. In fact, if you can't find something two of you enjoy, what you can do is that on a certain day, do something the wife enjoys, and on another day, do something the husband enjoys. All right? That's what love is about. It's about sacrifice. All right? It's about intentionality. Like we normally say, you need to move from emotional love to intentional love. <laughs> One of the things we hear a lot in counseling is, is the thought that I, I, I need a new spouse. All right? I need a new spouse. Most people think like that. They think, oh, I've grown out of love. I don't love him anymore. I don't love her anymore. Listen, um, if love can grow, love can die. So what it means is that you must be intentional in feeding love and in building love. So find things you can do together. Can you watch movies together? Um, can you read a book together? Can you watch a TV series together? Um, if you guys have not had time to pray in a while together, pray. Because the, the secret is this, and let me just say this. The secret to a strong marriage is intimacy. I'm going to, in subsequent editions, I'm going to spend time on that, um, you know, elaborately. But let me just tidy it up here with you a bit. Um, the secret to a strong marriage is intimacy. If a marriage is strong, if, if there's good intimacy in a marriage, it can survive anything. All right, this is a popular saying in our ministry also. If intimacy is solid in a marriage, it can survive anything. You see, usually when a marriage breaks, it's not what it went through that made it to break. It's actually the lack of intimacy. You know, just like when the Bible says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. What they're trying to say is that it's not the adversity that made you faint. It was the fact that your strength was small. So the same thing applies to marriage. If your marriage breaks, it's usually because of a lack of intimacy. That's why you must constantly feed that intimacy. When there's good intimacy in a marriage, it can survive infidelity, it can survive infertility, it can survive insufficient funds, it can survive in-laws, it can survive, you know, um, third-party interference, it can survive anything. 
if the intimacy is solid. But most times when a marriage breaks, it's not the in-laws that made it break, it's not the uh, financial challenges that made it break, it's not the infertility that made it break. It's the lack of intimacy. And the thing about intimacy is that it must be built. It doesn't just happen. To be intimate means into my mate. So it's something you have to consciously build uh, right, to each other. It takes openness, it takes intentionality, you know, and takes commitment to do that. All right, so if you might couple this uh, first season, make plans. What are your plans? Don't just, don't just leave it by to chance, no. Make solid plans to spend time together. Make solid plans to do things together. As a family, then as husband and wife. Very important, all right? And it will be uh, a great festive season for you. Your love will be rekindled. Your love will be refired. Uh, the passion you have for each other, you know, will be rekindled again and again and again in the name of Jesus. Um, um, you know, you, you can watch good videos together, good teaching videos together, things like that. It will help both of you to grow more in love. And that is what we will hope to do um, by this special program that we're doing, encouraging you and strengthening your relationship. All right. So thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you. Your love will grow, grow deeper and deeper in the name of Jesus. And, um, you know, you, you'll grow to know each other better. You'll grow to love each other better in the mighty name of Jesus. All right. Thank you. See you in the next episode. If you've never received Christ into your heart, this is your moment. Say these words with me. Oh Lord God, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I believe he died to save me. I believe God raised him from the dead and he's alive today. I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord of my life from this day. And by faith in him, I receive eternal life into my heart into my spirit. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. I have eternal life now. I am a child of God now. I am born again. Thank you, Lord. Amen.